Hi there, Bronze of Modern Gods. That music, that logo, that guy. It's Richard. Hi, Richard. Hey, John. How are you doing? I am okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Bronze of Modern Gods. Hi, new people. Lots Be of careful. new people. I know. <laughs> Be careful uh, with those gestures. Look, the new. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> you're on the podcast you are missing out we have discovered uh facetime gestures now that work with um stream here and okay richard i know you love this i'm gonna be holly johnson from frankie goes to hollywood ready all right Mahaya. <laughs> relax uh is this a comic book podcast i think it is hi everybody uh we've got our yes, girl a lot nowadays <laughs> push the envelope uh i was talking with someone one of our listeners um over the weekend uh, dming us and they they made uh, a mention that they love all the inside jokes that we have here and i said yeah for all the new people you will get 10 percent of the running jokes. So don't feel bad if we say things that you don't understand them. Stick around, after about 30 days, you're gonna get about 50% of the running gags. And after about 60 days, it goes back down to 10. So <laughs> be prepared for that. Uh, but you should know we have regular stuff like the underrated books of the week. This week, the old fart rule, where we go back to 1984, viewer mail, and we start off with our hot book of the week. Richard, you sold your. <laughs> I did sell mine. I sold mine uh, over at California Comic Con. It is Fantastic Four number one, the Golden Record reprint from 1966. Uh, oh. This is this is spiking because of the announcement we'll talk about in a minute of the cast for the Fantastic Four movie coming out in 2025, 2026. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, this book was published in 1966. The, the original was published in 61. Um, you could tell the difference between the original and this one by it's the, the reprint is missing the, uh, price and the issue number on the cover, uh, as are all of the golden record reprints. And the back cover is actually an ad for, uh, other, uh, golden records. And, uh, so you can differentiate it, but you know, this book has the same kind of patina as the original being also being a sixties book. It has that same kind of aging that you would get off the original. And uh, I used one. I had a copy, as John mentioned, uh, a 9.6, that I was was my placeholder for FF1 since I wasn't going to get an FF1 anytime soon. Um, but it's especially, so it's a great substitute. Especially now. <laughs> yeah, especially now. Um, the 9.6 for this book, uh, the last sale was 1560. Um, I had mentioned that because that sale was this year. It was actually in January. A uh, 9.8, the last time it sold was in the comic boom of 2022, and it sold for five grand. So these prices are minuscule compared to the prices you'll pay. I was trying, I was looking at a 1.0 over at California Comic Con of the original. And a 1.0, I couldn't find for any more than six grand. Um, so you know take take that you can buy a nine six here for fifteen hundred and sixty bucks or um a, a 1.0 for six grand of the original so that's why it's popular and i think it's why it's taken off i have to ask you you sold yours two mm -hmm. weeks ago. two weeks ago regrets you know i thought about that i've been thinking about that ever since i saw you know this 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 pick um no not really it, it's okay. you know it's now th there are other books in this run that i would i would have more of a hold on like fantastic four number five um that book is important to me for a variety of reasons and it'd be difficult for me to part with that one but this one this one i didn't have a problem it was like i said a placeholder i thought it was a good time to sell and i had a good market and uh, i got good money for it so i'm not i'm not complaining you had a little uh, you got flush with cash from your sales at Comic Swap the day before, and then the day of the convention, you were uh, tempted via me by not one <laughs> but two low grade Fantastic Four number ones. Uh, right. It was I was in a, a Looney Tunes cartoon and I was Grandma baking the pie, and you were Sylvester <laughs> the cat, like following the aroma. Uh, You're the little devil on my shoulder trying to get me to buy. Regrets not buying an FF1 now? 
No, I still, I still don't. I still okay. don't. I mean, six grand, six grand is, is what I could talk them down to. I mean, mm -hmm. it was, they're asking more than six. I think that's what I could have gotten it for. Um, I, it, not really. If, if it, maybe if it was a higher grade and, and they, they presented better, I, I might, but neither one of them were, I, I would say great presenting books. I don't have to have a, a number one at that price. I'll be satisfied in having $6,000 in my pocket. <laughs> Regrets are for losers. Just kidding. Yeah. There'll you be should. some other, there'll be some other book that I'll, I'll buy. You know, it's, that's one thing everybody has to realize that for, with very few exceptions, there are more books out there. If you, if you miss out on that one book, that one copy, there are more copies out there you'll come across in your future. And uh, so don't look at it as, as I got to buy it now kind of thing. Unless it's Venus 19. All right. Uh, Fantastic Four movie announcement. Uh, we talked a bit about this on our members only live chat on Friday. Uh, for those of you who are not members, please, what's wrong with you? Uh, this is uh, our topic uh, for starting off the show. I like the fact that it's 1963. Uh -huh. you know? That's um, perfect. Yeah. What do you think of the casting? It's it's good. Um, Vanessa, I'm not sure. I, I I haven't had a chance to look through her um, her <laughs> IMDb page. I was waiting for you to finish that sentence. <laughs> um, so I, I I'm I'm not really sure about her. Pedro Pascal is is has been as we talked in the live show. He's been just knocking it out of the park between the Mandalorian and Last of Us and. Uh, he's, he's just an in-demand actor and I think he's going to do a good job in this. I'm not familiar with the other actors. No, uh, I recognize so. the one guy from, uh, oh gosh, I'm blanking now. One of the shows I watch and I, he's really good. Uh, I think he's playing the thing. Uh, it, Pedro's got to shave that mustache. Uh, I, I can't have Reed Richards with a mustache. I'm sorry. Um, and Vanessa Kirby, she already gets my vote because her last name, <laughs> I think it's brilliant. You know, it's it's a good move. I don't know if brilliant is a great word, but it's a good move to pick people who aren't well known that are young because they will grow into that role and have the ability to play that role for a long time. I mean, look how long yeah. Hugh Jackman played yeah. played Wolverine uh, and is still playing Wolverine. Yeah. So I think it's a good um, move. If you are freaking out about uh, Fantastic Four, I believe it's 209, first appearance of Herbie the Robot. Don't stop it. It's Herbie the robot. It will go back down eventually. Uh, speaking of things going down and, and uh, I don't know, Madam. <laughs> Where are you going with that? <laughs> I, I was, I was going to make a, it's not a misogynistic joke. I swear to God. I was talking about the box office. Madam oh. Webb got beat out this weekend by a Bob Marley biopic at the box office. Are we surprised by this? Was anyone surprised by this? We all saw the trailer. No, no, the trailer was bad. And apparently it, it was, you know, to a bad movie. So that's not, it's not surprising. It's disappointing. Uh, I, I think Sony has could spend that money and, and make a good spider movie as opposed to what this was. Um, I'm, you know, every time they have a bad movie, it's, it sets the bar back in terms of you know something that could be potentially good it makes it more it makes sony more risk averse so it's it's too bad i i can't help but believe these are loss leaders to retain the rights uh they yeah. don't care. this morbius craven coming i don't think they care i think it's we have a contractual obligation to deliver something and therefore we keep the rights to spider-man in perpetuity and uh it's kind of like have you heard warren Beatty has the rights to dick tracy still no i didn't still really because every he, he has he's contractually required to make some sort of sequel and apparently the the verbiage is nebulous enough that what he does is he does these little tv specials that air on tcm at like two in the morning they're like a half hour long where he's dressed as dick tracy and he just talks to leonard malton about crap and that counts. They wow. they just they just aired one like a week ago, and I never heard this. And I saw it online. I was like, "This is an urban myth, right? It's a legend." No, it's true. Google 
Warren Beatty, Dick Tracy writes. And it's amazing. It's these mind-numbingly banal conversations with Leonard Malton. And he's dressed, the last one was done by Zoom. That's how much effort he's put into oh, this. Wow. wow. To retain the rights. Why does he want to retain the rights to Dick Tracy so bad? I don't know. He's Warren Beatty. He's nuts, right? But you know, Sony, Sony, I, I understand the, the 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 desire to retain the rights. But Sony also makes Into the Spider Verse, which those movies have been amazing. And it's not just me, my particular bias talking here. They have been blockbuster successes. But they take four years. That's the okay. issue. They have to deliver. I, I forget what it is. You guys in the chat probably know. Uh, they have to deliver something within a time frame on a consistent okay. basis. And it, it's kind of like really how we talk about uh, trademark preservation comics from Marvel. Yeah, right, or right. Something like the bug one shot it, solely to keep the trademark and preserve the trademark. That's what they're doing. And it's, you know, corporate bean counters don't care. It's short sighted. It ruins the brand. They yeah. keep it off brand enough that it doesn't taint the spider brand. I mean, you know, the average civilian looks at Madam Web and goes, what the hell is this? Um, who right. cares? You gonna go see it? No, nah, no. Nah. I'll wait till it comes to uh, to streaming services. I'm, I really don't have. I I I have been beaten down by, by Marvel movies recently, and uh, I want to retain that spark of hope that Fantastic Four is going to be good, uh, or um, whatever else, whatever next they come out. I want to to keep that spark alive. Sony could send me a check for four hundred dollars, and I would not watch it. Oh, that's a lie. Of course, I, would. Uh, <laughs> I dare you, Sony, to send him a check. Prove it, Sony. <laughs> Put your money where your mouth is. Speaking of putting your money where your mouth is, support the show. Yes, you can become a member for our channel right here on the YouTube's for the low, 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 low cost of two ninety nine a month. Say it, Richard. It's less than a Starbucks. Thank you. Less than a copy of the new issue of Captain America, in fact, which is really yeah. depressing. Show your support. Get a few perks as well. <clears throat> you get to hear me cough like that live on members only live streams. You get extra you show. You hear me talk about crying. Yes. <laughs> if you were a member, you would hear that. Richard cried. <laughs> um, extra show and tell episodes on Wednesdays where Richard will cry. We'll make him cry. Trust me. Uh, shout outs in future videos, new members. Look at the new members, the names, the names, Richard. Look at them on the screen. Uh, Richard and I are going to shows. In fact, we got hit up uh, about Neo Comic Con coming up again in August of this year. Richard, should I plan my plane tickets now? I think so, right? Yeah, yeah, it'll be a good time. Plus many other shows before then. Just hit join right here next to the subscribe button if you're on YouTube. If you're listening on the podcast and you feel the need for speed, go on to YouTube, go to the channel, hit subscribe while you're at it, join there. Uh, and if you're watching this on the live premiere, I swear this time for sure, I'm giving away free one month gift memberships during the live premiere of this episode. Last month or last week, I screwed it up uh, technically. Hopefully I've got it all worked out this week. So if you're in the live chat right now, you might suddenly get a uh, notification saying you are a member for free for one month. And we're done with the hard sell. Time for show and tell. Oh, boogie, wait, wait, wait. Mm, show and tell <laughs> screen. Oh, oh no, John has a new toy. <laughs> Richard. Do you want to start? Sure. Why don't you start? I, 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 I'm going to start off with, you're talking about Fantastic Four. Fantastic Four, annual number two. Now, we have not heard of who the villain is going to be in the new Fantastic Four movie, but I have my hopes as to who potentially the new villain. Did you want to give anybody a hint? I, 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 I think people get the hint. Um, this, this is uh, annual number two. This is really, really a hard book to come across in high grade. Uh, it is one of those square bound books that uh, just, just is, is difficult to get um, to survive in high quality. So this is an A5. This is one of the highest grades I've ever seen. Where did you get and, that? Why do I, why do I not remember you having this book? No, really? No. I got this. 
Oh, I got this from eBay, I believe. I have to check my notes. How long um, ago? About almost a year, a year and a half ago. Good for you. Good, very high grade for that book. Yeah, and it has that lovely multicolored Fantastic Four logo that I really just enjoy beyond measure. Sixty three, sixty four. They did that, and it just it works on queen size Millie the model. It doesn't quite work here. Uh, not so much. Not so much. Patsy's but yeah, fashion. early, early Fantastic Four, early, early Doom. And uh, I like this much better than annual one with some Mariner on the cover and, and all that. Look at the blood. I, 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 like, I, love, I love that book. I have a theme. I have a theme. Oh, uh, la, la, la. My theme this week is big and little. Okay. Okay. That's so Ant-Man. That's what she said. Ant-Man. Uh, close big books little books starting with a big book ah treasury i found it um <laughs> where was it if you've listened to this show for a while like i was saying about running jokes you've heard me mention that i i've lost my 2001 treasury edition i had no idea where it was um i was cleaning the garage this weekend looking for some stuff uh, and I came across a box. I was actually looking for a DVD, completely separate, um, unrelated, something that wasn't available on streaming I wanted to watch. And as I'm going through my boxes looking for the DVD, I come across this box. Inside the box, all my Jack Kirby collector tabloids that I thought I threw away when I moved. I have a whole box of them. I was so excited. Plus, my treasury editions were in this box, including my 2001. I know I didn't throw it away. I knew I still had it somewhere and I finally found it. it it's gorgeous. I mean, it looks, looks a great condition. I've never pressed a treasury edition. It, it's got a bit of a spine roll. It's got, I love, I love that it has an arrival date of June 22nd on it from uh, 1976, but it is, it's, it's beautiful shape. Um, if they graded treasury editions, this would be a nine, four easy, uh, I wouldn't say it's a nine six, a nine two, nine four. Yeah. But uh, you guys uh, heard a few weeks ago about us discussing DC trying to assert their rights over this property. Uh, it's never been reprinted. It probably you never will be reprinted for the absolute near future. So if you can get one of these and you're a Kirby fan, it's amazing. Uh, so that's my first big book. What do you have next? Let's see. I'm going to pull out. I have a Captain America, all new Captain America. Uh, this is 2018. I don't remember which year this is. That's not Captain America. That's 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 why I picked it. OK, um, this is now the current cap in the MCU. This is Sam Captain America. I, I I hear you. I I, I hear you, and I uh, understand that sentiment. And frankly, I I I tend to agree. But this is the current current Captain America. My question, and the reason why I bring this in, is is this going to continue to be the Captain America in the MCU? Are we, we afraid talk- of reshoots? Well, we talked about in, 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 you know, in the members only stream, we talked about, um, you know, um, Captain America going back in time to return the uh, Infinity Stones. He could have done a lot of different things while they're in the past. Um, so we, we don't really know. We don't really know. I, and I, I hesitate on investing a lot of money in Sam Wilson as Cap. Not that I don't think he's a, he, you know, the, I can't remember the actor's name who plays him, but his, his series was very, very well done. I mm-hmm. thought it was great. Falcon and Winter uh, Soldier was good. I really enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. So uh, I don't, I don't have necessarily, a, I don't have a problem with an African American Captain America. I have a problem with, with Cap not being Steve Rogers. <laughs> That's that's the whole thing. Cap has been Steve Rogers since 1940 something. Mm-hmm. I, I it's, it's it's just one of those things where the identity is tied to the individual. I yeah. think and, and it's been proven. You know, he 
when he stopped being Captain America and he, and he was just simply the captain, mm -hmm. he was still Steve Rogers. You know, the, you know, he still had that, that, um, yeah. So, so that's that was, Mark, that was Mark Grunewald's entire point with that story was just because it's a costume doesn't make you Captain America. The exactly. Captain exactly. America. So I don't know what's going to happen with this. I really don't. I have I have a, a bunch of books related to um, Sam as Cap, and I, again, I don't. It's I don't have a problem with him being Captain America. I have a problem with Captain America not being Steve Rogers. It's completely <laughs> semantics. It sounds like, but that's that's my problem. I might be wading into, into muddy waters here that I shouldn't be wading into, but that's never stopped me before. He's no longer the Falcon. That takes away one of the few legacy African-American superheroes that was his own person, not yeah. an offshoot, not, not, you know, uh, a, 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 a spinoff character. He was the Falcon and it was mm -hmm. Sam Wilson. And now there's no, there's a new Falcon, whatever, you know, it, 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 I don't know. It's weird. It is weird. And you're right. Whatever. It's not, we don't have any investment in the new Falcon. Um, mm -hmm. we had an investment in, 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 Sam as the Falcon, even, you know, in the MCU in the comics. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird when Marvel messes with the formula of, of such an iconic character. And yeah. I can understand wanting to update it to modern times, but there are some, some things I think, um, just transcends you know, different generations. And I, you know, Sam, you know, Sam is great, but you know, Steve is Captain America. The fans spoke, the fans let it be known. The Sam Wilson, Captain America series got canceled. So I don't know what to tell you. Um, I, when the fans speak, you got to listen, I suppose. Do, do, oh. do they, does Marvel listen when the fans speak? No. <laughs> no. And in some cases, you got to ignore the fans, but in this case, I don't know. All right, yeah. big and little. Okay. Back to little, all right? You did big, mm -hmm. now little. Richard, I give you bubble funnies. <laughs> all right, he's holding a teeny tiny copy of the Hulk, Incredible Hulk. Oh, man. Bubble funnies were sold at the candy counter. Mm -hmm. They came, there's the back, bubble funnies. Circa 1978, I believe, they came with a piece of gum wedged in here, the back cover. Oh, is 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 it archival gum? <laughs> no, I believe I chewed it in 1978. <laughs> uh, and it has a little comic book inside drawn by Herb Trimpey versus mm -hmm. the leader. Obviously, lots of uh, subplots and deep characterization in this story the room they had to work with. Um, but there are several of these. This is the Hulk one. And there was many of these. I used to have all of them. I don't know what ha I have four that have survived. Uh, mm -hmm. Richard, this one's for you. Spider Woman. Okay. Versus Dr. Doom. There he is. Uh, Spider Woman versus Dr. Doom. Then we have Sabrina. The Teenage Witch, mm -hmm. and everyone's favorite te perennial teenager, Archie. Is that the eighties? The eighties ish, most eighties cover you've ever seen? Is this the eighties? Yeah, Archie and Veronica on roller skates. Yeah, I gotta eat my cheaters here. What year was this? It doesn't say. Uh, but Bubble Funnies. I I remember. I never saw these before, uh, and I was on vacation at my grandmother's house in Sandusky, Ohio, miles and miles away from where I grew up. And I saw them and I was like, oh, these are comic books. And they have, I had to buy them all. There was a Captain America one. There's a Spider-Man one. I don't have them, but uh, bubble funnies. Sweet. What do you have next? Uh, let's see. I'm uh, talking about, I, you know, I've had wall books here and some of people may not see the wall books that are on the wall over here. Um, this is, uh, showcase 22, right? Am I right? I'm sorry. Showcase 79. Duh. <laughs> uh, dolphin first appearance or first cover appearance of dolphin. Um, I just love, I just love this cover. This is, this is a book that I bought for the cover. 
Uh, it's also a high grade book, which is it's a tough that green is tough to um, to get in high grade. So A5 to me is as high as I'm going to get within my price range. That's like a nine and for any other Silver Age DC. J. Scott Pike. Yeah. Is the, the artist. Famous romance artist. Did a lot of romance mm -hmm. comics from Atlas and DC back in the day. Did you buy that raw and submit it yourself? I did not. Oh, okay. Not. Why do I, I bought the Pardon? Why do I remember you buying it raw? I have had, I have had raw copies of it, um, and then I got this. Uh, I believe I got this at NeoCon a number of uh, two years ago. That's and, two bucks uh, for you, Eric. The third one, we will charge you. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so anyway, yeah, this is high high grade, uh, good girl art kind of cover, and. Um, Love it. This is this is this is one of those permanent collection books. I sure. I have a, a, a good attachment to this book. I can't ever see you selling that one unless it's to you get an upgrade. Uh, yeah, big, little, back to big. Something else I found in the garage that I completely forgot I had. Frankly, Howard, Howard the Devil, Treasury Edition number twelve with the Defenders. Uh, important book. It has a new story where Howard uh, joins the Defenders. Howard is officially a Defender. If you look at the Marvel uh, official guide to the Marvel Universe, Howard is listed as a Defender. It's pretty it's high grade, bad. except for, see that bottom corner? Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, I don't know what happened. It got scraped oh, Yeah, you know, these things don't store very well, which, I love this. I love my 2001. I love my Captain America Bicentennial Battles, which is over here. Where do I keep them? They end up in the garage in a box. I can't buy a bag of 100 Treasury Edition bags. I have three Treasury Editions. So, viewers, I suggest all of us go in together on a bag of Treasury Edition bags. <laughs> Between all of us, we we might make a hundred. <laughs> we'll invest together, and then we'll divide them amongst all the people that contribute. Leave a message in the chat if you want. To I contribute. thought you were going to say we should all petition CBCS to grade Treasury editions. Can you imagine how big that slab would end up oh, being? Yes. It would yeah. be huge. Um, I don't know. I just I feel bad because they're not bagged, they're not boarded, but I'm not paying dollars for. A bag of yeah. Treasury Edition bags and boards, and I'm not going to use but three. Unfortunately, uh, Eric, you know our friend at Comics Art Go, was selling Treasury bags and boards one, you know, individuals, and so I bought five of them to bag mine. So mm. noted. Okay, does he yeah. sell sizes to fit bubble funnies? <laughs> that I don't know. You could probably fit forty different one bubble funnies in one. I wonder, do wonder if CGC would grade bubble funnies because they do grade those little March of Comics giveaways, you know, so mm -hmm. they're, they're funny looking too, because they seal the inner well to mm -hmm. the small size of the, of yeah. the comic. You're going to make them cut a piece of micro micro chamber paper small enough to fit in there. Exactly. Uh, I love these bubble funnies because they, uh, oh, you know what? I'm looking. Spider Woman does end up in bondage in the Spider Woman. So, oh, hey, kids, comics. All <laughs> right, let's go to everyone's favorite segment, yours and mine, Richard. It is viewer mail. You've got mail. You didn't have another show and tell, did you? No, that's, we're good. Okay, my first piece of viewer mail is from Peyton Ardoin. Sorry, Peyton, if I pronounce your last name wrong. Uh, talking about, I talked about the first uh, burn art, Claremont burn on the X Men Iron Fist 15 last week and i said do people care about the first artist uh drawing like you know uh i believe it was marvel team up 53 was the first john bernard on the x-men do people put value to that anymore and peyton writes i think a character's reception and popularity can often be directly tied to or at least heavily influenced by the artist's portrayal of them i'm 32 years old and i value some artists first works almost as much as other key issues on that note I think Daredevil 16, first John Romita Sr. work drawing Spider-Man is far too undervalued, but I guess it might be more sought after if it were in the ASM title. Uh, Peyton, Daredevil 16 is insanely undervalued. You have 
first John Romita Sr. You've got, I believe that's a Spider-Woman cross or Spider-Man crossover. It is a Spider-Man crossover. Um, key, key book used to command a premium back in the day in the Overstreet when you would go to Walden Books when you were uh, trusted to go walk away from your parents for about an hour and meet them back at the food court in front of Blimpies at 4.30. Uh, and I would go and look at the Overstreet for an hour in Walden Books because it was Nine ninety five, Richard. That is so much allowance money. I cannot afford it, so I have to go to Walton Books, look at the Overstreet, and memorize it every time we go to the mall. Uh, I agree with you, Peyton. Under undervalued. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Senior Spider, early Spider Man though, is kind of. Yeah. He's imitating Ditko. Yeah. <laughs> when when he first comes on, if you look, he's imitating Ditko for those first few issues, and it's kind of like, oh. That's what he's doing. And then he kind of settles in and does John Romita. Yeah. It's, you know, it's hard to fall in Ditko's shoes. I can't, I can't, no. uh, I can't I say that. Only Frank Robbins could draw legs like that. All right. What's your first <laughs> piece? Uh, my first piece is from Thomas J. He, he submitted a, a comment on the Bronze and Modern Gobs, 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 God's website. Gobsmack. Uh, Gobsmack. I found your podcast a year ago, and it's by far my favorite podcast on any topic. Oh, cool. Thank you so much. Since I had uh, run, uh, ran out of current material to listen to, I started going backwards in, into your older podcast. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> on, on a May 2022 podcast, you had a listener write that he was torn paying $650 for a Batman, Batman 125 Chip Zdarsky one and 250 ratio variant mm. john said uh try to work a deal with the lcs and maybe uh pay only 450 dollars for it richard said wait these modern variants variants rarely hold value over the, the ratio count 250 dollars for 250 uh ratio richard said hold off and buy it when it comes down knowing this podcast was almost two years ago i decided to look on ebay and see what uh, so who, see who gets the kudos. And as suspected, all the kudos goes to Richard as the CGC 98 currently listed at $189 and raw for $89. I said till uh, this just I said this just to point out that there is still entertainment value in the older shows. Thank you for what you do. Uh, you make my trip to work enjoyable. Hope to be an avid listener for many more years to come. Thanks, Thomas. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, you know, it's so easy to get caught up in the FOMO of these titles and the uh, rare variants and ratio variants, and you know, paying two hundred, paying three times the ratio. You know, sometimes seems to be a wise choice. Other times, you know, it it, it doesn't. Most times, these variants just don't hold the value of the uh, the A cover. So, um, buy with some reservations and, and think about the book and as a long-term investment, if you're planning on investing, if, if you want to buy the book because you like the variant cover, I've got plenty of variant covers. I just bought, I really don't care what they're worth. I wanted the, the particular artwork that went with it. But if you're looking for an investment or a speculation, be very careful about buying these variant covers. Look, people, I was excited about NFTs. Yeah. <laughs> so grain of salt. Uh, this is not investment advice and you should always consult a lawyer or a financial advisor. My first piece of your email is from a longtime member, Mark LaPuma. Hi, Mark. Uh, for the fella asking about the amazing Spider-Man 129 for reference, and we're talking about last week where someone wanted to buy a, a first appearance of the Punisher and it had tape on it and a hole in the cover. I believe he uh, had a footprint on it. Uh, you know, <laughs> a bug was smashed in the middle of it. Uh, I had one graded last year that unfortunately had a cigarette burn in the back cover that went through a page as well. Came back a 4.5. Mm. I'd recommend the CGC grading guidelines book as well. I found it very helpful as I mostly buy raw and grade my own books. Thanks, John and Richard. Thank you, Mark. Mark, do you agree with that grade? 4.5 cigarette burn. That cover. Mark or LaPuma. Richard, do you agree with that grade? Uh, with the cigarette hole? No, I, I really don't. Uh, you know, to me, that's three. Um, Mark, 
love to see Sorry. it. I want to see it. Is it a yeah. little hole? You know, uh, dude, God bless you for having that come back a 4.5. That's amazing. Um, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe I'm being a little too harsh on it, but, uh, dude, it was kind of a gift grade. Yeah. And he, he, he speaks about the, 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 um, grading guide, which you yeah. see just post on their website and it tells you exactly. Well, it gives you a sentence to describe what CGC considers each of the different grades. There's also a section for, for uh, page uh, quality. Um, so if you want to check that out, it will give you a rough idea what a, the difference between a 4.5 and a 4.0 is, for example. Indeed. Uh, what is your next piece of viewer mail? My next piece of viewer mail is from um, a member, Indian, uh, Indiana guy. Indiana guy is a frequenter of our uh, live live uh, podcasts. I finally picked up my Fantastic Four number twenty. Congratulations! Uh, it's a grail for my PC. Do either think Molecule Man will play a part in the Secret Wars uh, MCU rendition similar to the twenty fifteen series? I feel he is needed, but wonder about if he will ever be per, uh, even be portrayed. Keep up the good work. By the way, Richard, looking forward to your FF corner box. Always great content uh, that keeps me coming back worth more than a Starbucks beverage. Indeed. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks, Indiana guy. I, I, I don't know. Mo Molecule Man is, oh, man. That'd be tough it's, on film. Yeah. Because yeah. he can do anything, you know. Well, it, he, he's like that. He's like vehicle. When I could see him, if, if they need some radical change or some something, um, you know, he's kind of the character that could do that. Mm -hmm. But uh, turn if, Sam if he, back to the Falcon, <laughs> right? Well, if he let me just put it this way, if he is in uh, in the Secret Wars, he won't survive the Secret Wars. I feel. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. Uh, he he can do anything with his little magic wand. Uh, and he is usually beaten by uh, psychological manipulation. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to come up with a real good, I mean, visually it'd be impressive, but you know, was there a rule for the molecule man that he couldn't, it wouldn't work on organic matter. I think that was the rule for the molecule man. Um, because what's well, going to stop him from turning the entire fantastic four into sand immediately. Okay. The movie's over <laughs> credits roll. <laughs> Right. I mean, how do you deal with a character that has that kind of capabilities? Yeah. Um, yeah. Stan and Jack would have come up with creative ways to use him. Uh, Jim Shooter, you know, uh, put him with Volcana. Remember in Secret Wars 2, there were a couple. Yeah, and, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, that takes a lot of work. I don't know. Um, my next piece of your mail is from Mark Vega. You know what? After you started trashing that Hulk annual by John Byrne, <laughs> last week's show. I was just reminded of my talk, talk with Mike Vosberg over at the California Comic-Con. Ever since I saw your video interview with Ron Mars, I think you mean Ron Friends, at LA Comic-Con, I've been trying to talk to artists who attend cons about their past work. I want to know more about their stories since they're getting older and we don't know how long they'll be here with us. I had Mike Vosberg sign my Punisher number five and when he saw it, he said, you just had to bring this book. He said he was rushed to finish the pencils on that book. He was given two weeks. And when he submitted it, the editors at Marvel told him it was some of the worst work they've seen. I was Holy. laughing. Thought I would share. He's a nice guy. I'm definitely going to be talking to more artists like that at Con. Yes, Mark. That's why they're there. You know, we were nervous to talk to Chaikin. I look back now and I think we should have gone and talked yeah. to Chaikin. Um, Mike Vosberg, it was a Chaikin uh, assistant, I believe. He used to work in Chaikin's studio. He started off kind of as a bit of a Howard Chaikin clone. He was famous for drawing a lot of the female titles like Starfire and uh, uh, things like that. I'm blanking on the other ones he drew. Um, but, you know, if, if an editor gives you an assignment, hey, we need this book in two weeks, and you hack it out and you make the deadline, they lose their right to tell you it's a bad job. <laughs> right. You know? Right. You need, Mike Vosberg should have rolled the pages up into a cylinder and put it in the editor's posterior for putting him in that position, because that's, you know, to go back to Salvador LaRocca and our trashing of him, that's the difference here. You know, uh, Salvador LaRocca is squandering his talent and just hacking crap out a la Don Heck. 
Um, this is it's someone being asked. Yeah, this is someone asked being asked to deliver something because someone blew a deadline and they delivered to you and their career is going to suffer because, you know, it's not the best work, but they had to get it out and pay the rent. So whoever the editor was, I'm going to guess it was probably Carl Potts. Boo, boo on you, Carl Potts. You don't don't ask someone for a rush job, then complain when you get a rush job. Mark, thank okay. you for your, your email. Richard, what do you have? Mark? My last piece is from uh, Comics Watching 4851. I like your avatar, Comics Watching. I see. Yes, yes. I another, another, another person who, you know, who knows what John likes. <laughs> uh, there are actually two more Miles series after Ultimate Comics 2011, before the one that Richard showed. Ooh. There is Miles Morales, The Ultimate Spider-Man in 2014, and Spider-Man uh, 2016. That one is from 2018. I showed a comment. I showed, I don't have it handy, but I showed a Miles Morales uh, Spider-Man book. You know, it all started, I have, there we go. Oh, yeah. it all started with this lovely, lovely thing um ultimate fallout so yeah th thank you thank you for the clarification um and i kind of lost track because i i wasn't i didn't buy any of these books off the newsstand any of these um these are all things that i purchased later so my my timeline for the different series for miles are a little little muddled so thank you yeah um can you believe miles morales was created 13 years ago i know uh, it just seems like it, everyone keeps you know the new spider-man it's a fad miles is gonna go away it's like you know when rap came out in the 80s <laughs> yeah, well you think around. do you think uh spider boy is a fad yes yeah I do it's different i mean that's th this was uh this was something that was new and needed as opposed to something just completely derivative and you know marvel fans when we were growing up richard what did we used to make fun of dc and superman for supergirl superboy super horse super <laughs> super <laughs> superman family it's so infantile and childish here we are uh she was on the other foot marvel yeah yeah you know i i never thought in that context but you're right yeah it's the old Marvel family, you know, taking all these, you know, boy. Where, where's Uncle Dudley Spider-Man? I, I, we're waiting for you. Boy, you know what we sound like, Richard? Yes. We sound like a couple of old farts. Old farts. <gasps> it's the old fart rule. Hi, new viewers. What is the old fart rule, you ask? I think it's pretty self-explanatory. It's when we go back 40 years to the books that shaped us old farts in the comic book collecting community. We're in 1984, Richard. We're a year ahead than we were last year. That's how years work. Now you know. <laughs> That's pretty much how they work. <laughs> Just want to make sure everyone was clear on how years work. Uh, Prince Namor, the Submariner, particularly issue two. This was a four issue miniseries by Bob Budiansky and J.M. DeMatteis. Uh, this was the first Submariner series since his, uh, his uh, show, his series was canceled in the uh, mid seventies. Um, it's interesting, this miniseries, because it came after there was one announced that was gonna be by Jim Shooter and Alan Weiss that was in production forever and it never came out. Uh, this miniseries in typical J.M. DeMatteis, uh, uh way you know it's always a social issue with with him it seems it touches on the poverty and the rebellion in the outer colonies of atlantis here's the hook that got me though in this issue it ties in nicely with namor remembering the shame he felt as being a homeless man on the streets of new york city before he was just, yeah, there it is. See their face that's exactly the reaction <laughs> i had i forgot about that you yeah. know when the human horse discovers him in Fantastic Four number four. He's living in a flop house. He's living in a, uh, he's a hobo. He's got, right. you know, he, he's got a stick on his shoulder with a little cloth bag behind it with his Speedo inside, I guess. Um, yeah, I thought that was a neat little 
callback that we don't we don't it's a it's a forgotten era of the submariner you know mm -hmm. between world war ii and whenever the fantastic four now takes place he was homeless and an amnesiac that was an interesting way of just you know dealing with that transition from golden age to the silver yeah. age yeah for sure um as far as this book i'm assuming you were reading comics then did you read this book you're you're a big namor fan i am a big namor fan i read the the namor series i don't remember this mini series though it was before that it was a few years before that uh a cgc 9.8 of this issue sold in december for 60 dollars. twist plot twist meanwhile a cbcs 9.8 of this book sold the same month in december for $99. <gasps> Mythbusters. <laughs> you know, it's a it's one example, but I just found that interesting that a CBCS copy sold for $30 more than a CGC yeah. copy. Uh-oh. Underrated books of the week. Richard, is this really underrated? Uh I you know, okay. So I picked a Daredevil 227. Uh, which is the start of the apocalypse storyline. And I, I, I think there are a lot of daredevils, especially, you know, given that this is a Frank Miller story, uh, doesn't get the due that it deserves. Uh, just, to, just to back up a little bit. So, so Karen Page, who was um, Matt's secretary and his old girlfriend uh, is on skid row. She's a drug addict. She's in Mexico and he, she needs money. She's you're leaving out a very important part that she was as well. What? She was a drug addict addict. She was mm -hmm. in Mexico. She was doing pornography. Oh, that's, yes, she was. Yeah, they mm -hmm. right. She she was uh, popular at the stag parties. They said in the book. At least uh, make up a, a stage name, Karen. Come on. <laughs> So she sells, you know, she sells the only thing she has left, which is, you know, the identity of Matt Murdock of, of, of Daredevil, the secret identity. And so she sells it to her, to her, um, her, uh, drug supplier who then it works its way up the chain of, of different criminals until it gets to the Kingpin and the Kingpin then knows, you know, his nemesis identity and spends, you know, six months preparing to destroy Matt Mur Murdock's life and does a really, really good job of doing it. Um, you know, ends up uh, bribing people and threatening people to, to tell lies, gets um, the bank to foreclose on Matt's house. And, you know, if, you know, it's a look at the trials of Job, you know, it's, it's, it's taking a character and stripping away all of, all of the normalcy that they have and, you know, exposing, the things that makes him tick and makes him a hero. And, you know, the storyline is, is, is hard to read, but it, it, it really shapes him moving forward. And, um, you know, it's, it's Frank Miller's art. Frank Miller did the art in the story. And, you know, Dave, this Dave, is, Dave Mazzuccelli did the art. Frank just Dave Mazzuccelli it. was listed as also a part of, yeah. Uh, did he do the art in the whole book? He did the whole the whole story arc. Frank wasn't drawing at this point. He was just writing. Ah, okay. Um, you know, Frank. That's why Frank, it looks so good. <laughs> yeah, that was my point. I, and, and I was a bit confused because it says, <laughs> you know, if you look at an edition, it says Frank did, uh, it was Frank and, and uh, the other gentleman. Yeah. Um, you know, his it's, it's, it's story is great. And uh, if you haven't had an opportunity to read it, it's been reprinted several times. But uh, I listed this as under underrated because I think a lot of Daredevil's storyline um, is underrated. I'm hoping we're going to see interest in it because of the Daredevil TV series and Echo and and you know Kingpin is a prominent part of that as 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 is uh, Daredevil. So we'll 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 see. But anyway, um, this book the nine point eight goes for one hundred seventy three dollars. There's a new stand. Uh, variant as well that goes for 410. I've got a copy. I, I just didn't pull it. I have a copy of my collection because this was back 1986. I was hot and heavy in, in my comic book collecting and I was reading Daredevil because, you know, it's just, it was good, good stories back then. It was a good, good book to read. This is one of those examples where a name 
gets to come onto a title and completely blow everything up, you know, to the point where you change the essential nature of the book and then he gets uh-huh. to leave, you know, he doesn't have to write the follow-up. So you've taken away Matt Murdoch's identity, his law profession, you know, his life, and then you leave, to go to Hollywood. <laughs> And who's, who's supposed to pick this up now? What, what are you supposed to do with it? Amazingly, after a couple of aimless fill-ins, Anne Nascenti comes on the book and she has to follow this up. And she does, you know, she makes Matt a volunteer lawyer in Hell's Kitchen. You know, I, Frank, Frank did set that up, but you know, she had to write it. She had to make it work. Um, at least Alan Moore had the courtesy of making the Superman stories imaginary when he wrote uh-huh. and destroyed everything. It was Swamp Thing, you know, it was gonna die anyway. And he he wrote the follow-ups, you know, he, right, right. he constructed it, but he stayed on. So it's, I believe of all people, John Byrne made this point, you know, it's real easy to be a star, come on a book, blast everything apart, make this revolutionary change, then leave. It's really impressive to stay on and make that excitement continue for years and years, says the man who left several books after five or six issues. Uh, now, to be fair, he stayed on the Fantastic Four. There's one. So mm-hmm. I, while I love, you know, Born Again, while I love that story, I always read it thinking, eh, it's kind of unfair to everyone else. You get to come in and destroy the toys and then, you know, you don't have to clean up the mess afterwards. You know, you could also look at it as as a challenge. You know, you've you've got this broken thing, and uh, you get to rebuild it in the way that you want to rebuild it. And I think she did a great job in Born Again, pulling the pieces that uh, Frank Miller tossed around. Um, and I and I think Daredevil's a stronger character for it. Anna Senti arguably creating the last great new Daredevil villain, Typhoid Mary. Uh-huh. You know, I mean, that's impressive. I, you think about, you know, these are, uh, these iconic villains. Has there been one since Typhoid Mary for Daredevil? I don't think so. Um, yeah, I think the one before that, you could probably go back to Bullseye as being the mm-hmm. last iconic one. So, you know, Frank, great. Who did you create? You used the Kingpin and you used Bullseye. You didn't really nuke yeah, yeah. I guess. he created nuke i suppose i don't know uh, so i come to damn frank miller with faint praise <laughs> uh frank 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 miller is is he, he's a good he's a great writer in my opinion artists sometimes his his work isn't my favorite but uh, i love his just like alan moore i love his 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 work thumbs down Thumbs down gesture. Uh, my underrated book this week. We've been talking a lot about Conan, the Barbarian mm-hmm. Keys, this uh, past couple of weeks. Um, and by the way, I keep saying Conan because of Conan O'Brien. It's Conan, the Barbarian. Remember how we always used to mispronounce Conan's name as Conan O'Brien until we learned that it was Conan? Now I'm doing the same thing for Conan, the Barbarian. Conan the Barbarian, issue 275. This was the last issue of the original long-running Marvel series. Look at that Colin McNeil cover. Beautiful. Uh, What's interesting is the the book is canceled, but the story actually continues in Savage Sword of Conan magazine, number 218. Savage Sword of Conan would actually run for another two years past the regular title. I did not know that until I started doing the research here. It is tough in 9.8. This is why. It's almost an entirely all black cover along the spine, everywhere. Um, There's a single sale in the past year for $475 for this book. This is my copy signed by Roy Thomas. Nice. At the top there, this is a sticker on the bag, which I need to remove. I have not taken it out of this bag because of the seal. It is uh, number 595 of 750 copies signed 
by limited treasured editions. Uh-huh. It, I bought it in an auction. It's kind of got storage issues. If you look, um, it's a little bendy. It needs a press. I think I'm going to take it out and submit it to CBCS with all this documentation. And hopefully uh-huh. it'll come back with a yellow label. I'm sure it will. Um, Conan the Barbarian would be relaunched six months later as Conan the Adventurer. That would run for 14 issues followed by a series simply titled Conan that ran 11 issues. That's when they tried to image comics it up. Remember I showed that cover from that series a while ago where it's all Joe Bennett cover and he's all Rob Liefeldy and you all had a visceral reaction to that. And that was followed by a series of Conan miniseries until Marvel gave up the rights in the late nineties. So uh, Conan the Barbarian 275. Why do you think Conan ran so long? If you think about it, it went from the early 70s mm-hmm. all the way through the 90s and various simple you know various series why do you think it was so popular conan the barbarian ghost rider jonah hex gi combat books that comic book readers poo poo yeah whatever they're not superheroes civilians on the newsstand ate them up they would sell through on the newsstand back in the day when the newsstand was a thing. If you were a civilian, a non-collector, and you actually enjoyed reading comics and you were picking up your copy of uh, Harley Monthly or uh, Chicks and Guns or whatever you buy and you see Conan the Barbarian, you're going to throw it in your bag with you along with that GI Combat dollar comic. That's why they ran so long. People forget GI Combat and Sergeant Rock ran until like 1986, 87. Um, newsstand sales kept those books alive. Ghost Rider was a dog of a book uh, in the direct market. That's why it got canceled in 81. However, it sold really well on the newsstand and that's what kept it alive for so many years. So there's many examples like that. It doesn't happen anymore um, because the newsstand market is non-existent. Right. And by the way, it's kind of a good thing the newsstand market is non-existent. When's the last time you looked at a magazine in the supermarket checkout aisle? It's been forever. I encourage you, next time you're at the supermarket, everybody, the magazine racks are there. Pick one up and look at the price. $14.99 for a magazine. Holy moly. $14.99 for your magazines that are on the newsstand now. Is it because their print runs are so small? I mean, if I look for anything, I, I just look to the internet. I don't necessarily, because exactly. if it's in print in a magazine, like I used to read car magazines all the time. Yeah. It's out of date by the time it gets to the, you know, the printers and on the newsstand. I used to read muscle and fitness for the workouts. <laughs> and, uh, the clarification. <laughs> and it was not 1499 back then. Uh, yeah, no. You know, I mean, if I was going to spend $14.99 back then, I'd buy an issue of Honcho. Hey, that is a hint that it's time to wrap things up. (laughs) Uh, We will see everybody on Wednesday for members and everyone else will catch you next week. Yep. Everybody stay safe.